welcome you here to Calvary Chapel. Thank you for coming out. Thank you so much for bringing food. We've got a good crowd every Wednesday night, like to eat. So uh, we appreciate you doing that. Uh, we're going to be in the 21st chapter of the book of Numbers. Let me mention that uh, Pastor Jonathan has tested positive to COVID, so he's out tonight. Yep, yep. And he will, uh, he's sort of quarantining for a while, so. Uh, the kids will actually be upstairs, I believe. Uh, Jed's teaching tonight, and we're grateful for him. We're in the 21st chapter of the book of Numbers. Let's pray. Lord, we want to come to you this evening and just lift up our study to you, continue to open our hearts to your word. Lord, we want to know you. We want to understand your heart better. We want to be able to search the scriptures and to see the Lord, to see your great plan unfolding for us. And we pray that you would help us to not only read the word, but apply it in a personal way, in a corporate way, in our fellowship, in this world today. I pray that you would continue to guide and direct us and minister to us. Help us to grow and mature. In Jesus' name we pray. And Lord, we lift up Pastor Jonathan to you and Gracie. We pray that you would just protect them and watch over him. And as he has to protect Gracie, I know uh, she's expecting. We ask you just blessing on her. and. This little one, I just pray that you would protect uh, Jonathan and get him through this. And I just pray again uh, for anyone else. I know there's a lot of needs in our fellowship, physical needs. And we just ask your blessing upon us as a church, Lord. Continue to watch over us. May we honor and glorify you in all that we do. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, in chapter 21, I, I mentioned to you earlier in our study that I uh, asked you last week, you know, that uh, there's a cool passage we're going to look at tonight in this 21st chapter that really is a picture of Christ. And uh, last week we saw another picture of Christ. And so uh, I just want to challenge you as you read the Word of God and go through the Scriptures in the Old Testament too, that you look for Jesus and ask the Holy Spirit to enlighten and to uh, glorify the Lord and exalt the Lord and illuminate Christ to us. So it's very cool to see that. Uh, remember, Jesus existed before he was born in Bethlehem. He's the individual that uh, Micah talked about, whose goings forth were of old, uh, even from everlasting. And so he's the one that is called the great, uh, the great God, the one that before Abraham was, he said, I am. So he's in the Old Testament all over the place, and it's just a cool journey to look for Christ and to see him illustrated throughout the Old Testament. So look at the 21st chapter of Numbers. We will look, first of all, in verses 1 through 3. The Canaanites at Hormah are destroyed, and the king Arad, the Canaanite who dwelt in the south, heard that Israel was coming on the road to Atharim. Then he brought against Israel, uh, fought against Israel, he ate freely in Egypt. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. You know, again, Egypt is a picture of the world. God brought us out of the world into the kingdom, out of Egypt. You know, and that's the picture. Out of Egypt, through the Red Sea, a picture of dying to ourselves and, and the flesh dying and over into the, you know, back in the wilderness, into the promised land. It's a picture of the new birth. But this statement was made here in verse 5. We remember the fish which ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up. There is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. Now, the manna was like coriander seed, and its color was the color of bedellum, which is sort of like amber color, sort of a yellowish. The people went about and gathered it, ground it in millstones, and beat it in, in mortar, cooked it in pans, and made cakes of it. Its taste was like the taste of pastry prepared with oil. In other words, it was awesome. It tasted great. When the dew fell on the camp in the night, the manna fell on it. So this, this manna was very, obviously, they lived on it 40 years. Matter of fact, when they crossed over Jordan, that's when the manna stopped falling. So God, for 40 years, God fed the, the nation of Israel. There were three, approximately 3 million people. God fed them every day with manna. There were times that he brought other things. He brought meat from time to time, whatever. But I want to point out again, they, they say, oh, we remember Egypt. We remember what we had in Egypt. They forgot about the, the bondage. They forgot about the horrible life they had there. All they remember was the, you know, they lusted. It said they lusted exceedingly. It's like a person lusting. You know, they, they, they decide to follow Christ, but then they remember how it used to be when they were partying and when they were getting drunk and when they were, you know, taking drugs and where they're doing all these things. You know, been there, done that a little bit when I was a teenager. 
I'm telling you, it's not a very good life. As a matter of fact, these are the things that destroy people's lives. But it's amazing how people, they, they want to go back. They want to go back to Egypt, back to the old life, back to the old ways. And there's this distaste for manna. Now turn, if you will, to John chapter 28 in the New Testament in the Gospel of John. John chapter 28. No, that can't be. Oh, man. oh excuse me, John chapter 6, verse 28. That, that may be better, I think. We'll see. Oh, okay, yeah, chapter 6, verse 28. Now, again, so we read all about this man in the Old Testament. We read about the nation of Israel. All of a sudden, they don't like this man, and we don't like it. Well, look in verse 28 of chapter 6 of John. It says, they said to him, these are the disciples, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. That, of course, is Christ himself. Believe in me. That's the work. That's what God wants you to do. That's how to get to heaven. Verse 30. Therefore they said to him, what sign will you perform? Let me just give you a little background, okay, before we get to this. The background is he was out in the wilderness and they were hungry. And he took some loaves and fishes and fed them. You know, they were in the wilderness. And he said, you know, he said to his disciples, look, these, there's a big crowd here. There's a long way back to the city. They're not going to make it all the way back. They're going to faint. Because there's no food. And Jesus told us to feed these people. And they said, how can we, there's over 5,000 people. How can we feed them all? And so Jesus, all of a sudden, there's one of the disciples. I think it was Andrew said, there's a young man here that's got a loaf, a, a little bit of bread and fish. And Jesus took that little loaf and that little fish and he blessed it and broke it and fed 5,000 people. Now, the people started following Christ because they're thinking, oh, here's our meal ticket. It's like today. People follow Jesus. He's on my meal ticket. He's not a meal ticket. And people follow him for the right way. So my point in all this, Jesus now is sort of saying some things that he knows will intentionally offend them. Matter of fact, after this passage, after he says these things, the Bible says that a lot of people left and no longer followed him because they were very offended by what he said. What did he say? Well, let's read this. So they said to him, verse 30, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe? What work will you do? In other words, okay, what are you going to do for us? Our fathers ate manna in the desert. As, it, as it's written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Remember, they had just been fed by Jesus. 5,000 people and more actually. So it's like, man, we got to hang around this guy. we got free food. Verse 32, Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you that bread from heaven, because that's what they said. But who gave it? My Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives his life for the world. Who is that? Jesus. Jesus is, manna is a picture of Christ coming down from heaven, sustaining us, supplying for us, satisfying us. Verse 34 then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. Remember the woman at the well, the woman of Samaria? If you drink of the water that I give, you'll never thirst again. In my life, prior to my conversion, I had this deep desire for something I didn't have. I knew that I needed that. I remember telling God, Lord, I need you. I want to know you. I don't, I go to church, I read my Bible, but I've never seen any miracle. I've never seen any sign. I've never heard a voice. But I know you're out there somewhere. I need to connect with you. That was the cry of my heart. And, and that's the need of every person. You know, everybody needs something. And so what happens, they turn to drugs, they turn to party, and they turn to all kinds of things. And they often refrain from the very thing they really need, which is Christ. The Lord is what we need. So Jesus made that statement again in verse 35. I am the bread from heaven, of the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. Then if you look down at verse 48, chapter 6, verse 48 of John. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that, that, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. 
If anyone eats of this bread, he will, he will live forever, and the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarrel among themselves. See, they didn't understand what he said. They're like, this is weird. He's going to give us his flesh. So how can this man give us his flesh to eat? They were very offended. Well, what is he talking about? This is weird. Verse 53, Jesus said that in most assuredly I said to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. I, as the living Father sent me and, live because of, and, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me and will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, speaking of himself. And not as your fathers uh, ate manna and are dead, for he who eats the bread that I, uh, that, that, uh, excuse me, this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. And then look down at verse 63. He sort of clarifies it a little bit and says, It is the spirit that gives, uh, that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are what? Are spirit and their life. In other words, I'm not speaking literally. We, we shared communion last Sunday. And in communion, the bread symbolizes the body of Christ. The, the cup symbolizes the blood of Jesus. Every believer believes and partakes of the flesh of Christ in that we believe that he literally came from heaven. He died on the cross. He was buried. The third day he was raised again. We believe in his blood. That the, the blood is what makes an atonement or payment. In Leviticus, God said, I've given you the blood to make a payment for the soul. Because the life of the flesh is in the blood. And the wages of sin is death. So because we've sinned, there's got to be death. There has to be a, a payment made. God doesn't just overlook our sin and say, don't worry about your sin. It's no big deal. No, someone's got to be punished. So Jesus went to the cross, took our place. He was our substitute. He died physically. He also shed his blood. And because he shed his blood, we are partakers of that flesh and that blood by faith. And that manna in the Old Testament is a picture of Christ coming down from heaven, sustaining the people in the same way Jesus came down from heaven. He sustains us. He satisfies us. You know, this, the whole satisfaction, the whole meaning of life. Why are you here? Why are you created? What is your purpose in life? Your purpose in life is to know the Lord, to walk with the Lord. And until you know Jesus, you don't have any purpose. You're just wandering around hoping you get it right. You're not going to get it right that way. But when you come to Christ, he satisfies. That's what Jesus said to the woman at the well. If you drink of the water that I give, you'll never thirst again. So when you come to Christ and you believe in Jesus, there's a satisfaction, there's a peace, there's a joy, there's a knowledge that Jesus is the person, the one that I really needed. And in my life, at the age of 19, I gave my life to Jesus. I was born again. That quest that I had. You know, God's satisfied, and what led up to that, real quickly, I'll say this. My father started having this desire to know God, even though we went to church every Sunday. Going to church isn't going to satisfy that. Meeting Jesus and believing in Jesus will. You can go to church all your life and down and go straight to hell. You've got to put your faith and trust in Christ. So my father started having this hunger, this thirst that become growing, and the Holy Spirit began to quicken that and bring that out to him. So on Sunday nights, Dad started going to different churches. And my mom said to me one night, why is he doing this? What's wrong with our church? And I said, I don't know. I wasn't saved at the time. I wasn't a believer. Well, Dad comes home one night, totally changed, totally different man. And I realized that's what I needed. I needed what he has. I see this peace, this joy. He's so excited about the Lord. He met Christ. And he was in his early 50s at the time. So my point in all that is this is the manna from heaven. This is what satisfies. So going back to our study here, I don't want to, you know, keep on this too long. I may just get one chapter today. But so we see this statement in that they just didn't like this manna uh, down in our study of verse, uh, verse 5 of our study of 21, Numbers 21. Our soul loathes this worthless bread. But it shows you, this is, what, this is what the world thinks. The unbeliever thinks, this is worthless. This is just, you know, false ideas and some guy you can't even see. And you're giving your life to him. Yes, we are. We've met him. 
He's changed our life. But that's what they say. It's a worthless bread. So the Lord sent, verse 6, fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Now this serpent, these serpents were a picture of sin. Sin is the but We get stung by sin. We, we get bitten by sin. We're going to die from sin. The wages of sin is what? Death. Exactly. The wages of sin is death. Um. Then let's keep reading here. Look in verse 7. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. Notice that. Sometimes people go through a hard time. And say, well, I've, I've, yeah, I've done wrong. But they don't say that until all of a sudden there's a consequence. So there's a consequence. The consequence was they were getting bitten by the serpents. They put two and two together and realized that God's allowing this to happen. Verse 7, therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed to the people. Now God didn't give them what they wanted. God didn't give them the answer they wanted. Look if you in verse 8. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten when he looks on it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent. Bronze in the scriptures is a picture of or a type of judgment. Brass or bronze, either or, either of those metals. It's a picture of judgment. He says the Lord, uh, Moses made a bronze serpent, put it on a pole. So it was if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. So this is a very interesting way to cure and to fix all these problems. They finally admit their sin. Then all of a sudden we see this serpent being made into a pole, put on a pole, a bronze pole, and a bronze serpent. And if they got bitten, it didn't just go away. The Lord didn't drive the snakes away. They just had to look upon that bronze serpent and they were healed. Let me just mention this. In, turn if you will to Genesis chapter 3. Again, we're going to look at it a couple of verses. Genesis chapter 3. I want to look at this curse that God brings. Genesis chapter 3, verse 14. We're going to see how God curses the serpent. Chapter 3 of Genesis, verse 14. The Lord God said to the serpent. This was after Adam sinned. And God's going to curse the serpent. Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle. And more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust. All the days of your life, I will put in, and here's the first verse in the Bible that is prophetic, pointing to the coming of Jesus. Verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. Galatians, in the New Testament, brings out the statement, he says, not seeds as of many, but seed as of one. So in verse 15, he's speaking of one individual. I will put enmity between your seed and her seed, singular. The seed of the woman is the Christ. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So the serpent bruised the heel of Christ, but what did Christ do? He crushed the serpent's heel. I want to point out that the, the, the serpent was cursed. Let me also read, the, read this to you. Oh, let me ask you to turn, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 21. Go to Numbers and turn right. I know there's a number of verses we're looking at tonight, but I just want to point out Jesus. This bronze serpent is a picture of Christ. Chapter 21 of Deuteronomy, look in verses 22 and 23. God makes an interesting statement. Now, let me just point this out. You say to yourself, why would God say this? Okay, let me just say before we read this. God is saying this because he knows one day his son will be hanging on a cross. Look in verse 22. If a man has committed a sin deserving of death and he is put to death you will, and you hang him on a tree, if that's the way you decide to put him to death, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as the inheritance. Then it says... For he who is hanged is a curse of God. Whoever hangs on a tree is a curse of God. 
Now, who do we know? A famous person that was hung on a tree, on a cross. It was Christ. Christ himself. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Here's what it says. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it's written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So Galatians made the statement that we find here in number, uh, excuse me, Deuteronomy chapter 21 about cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree and says this verse is applied to Jesus. Why? Cursed is everyone. It says again, let me read that to you. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become, become a curse for us. For it's written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, a verse I use a lot. For he has made him, speaking of Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. God made Jesus to become sin. He became sin. He was cursed for us. He was judged for us. The judgment of God fell upon his Christ. It says that in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, when God looked down, saw the travail of his son on the cross, and was satisfied. Satisfied what? God the Father was satisfied that Jesus' suffering was payment for your sin and mine. So this whole bronze serpent is a picture of Christ being judged, becoming a curse. Cursed is the serpent. He became, so sin is killing the people, right? The serpent represents sin, body the people. Why? They were complaining. They acknowledged, we sinned. We've said something we shouldn't have said. We are sinning. Therefore, God has sent these serpents. It's a picture of sin. So what has happened? Jesus became sin for us, hung on a cross. Very interesting. And again, this bronze serpent represents judgment. So Christ was judged. I said before, God doesn't just ignore your sins. The wages of sin is death. If you sin one time, you're guilty of death. If you break one of God's laws, and we've all sinned. Romans chapters 3, or all the way, uh, all the way through chapter 3, verse, uh, I think it's verse 14 or 18. It tells us and proves. Paul talks about the Jews sinning and the Gentiles sinning and the, the nations that don't, they don't even have the law. They do by nature the things contain the law. These having not the law are lauded to the, themselves, which show the work of the law, written in their hearts, their conscience, bearing witness, their own thoughts, accusing each other. They're guilty. Paul's proving that even those that don't even have the law, they know they're guilty. When you're in some remote area of the world and you don't have the law, you've never heard, thou shalt not lie. What that is saying is the first time you lie, you know you've done something wrong. You kill somebody and you know in your heart you've done something wrong. You may not have a law that says thou shalt not kill, but when you sin, you know it. Your conscience condemns you. Because everybody sinned. The wages of sin is what? Death. Death. That, that's a law. That's a basic law. It's a fundamental law. God requires the, the shedding of blood. The shedding of blood, God requires it. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. So when you sin or I sin, somebody's got to pay the price. All these Old Testament animal sacrifices were just symbolic. Of Christ dying for us, shedding his blood for us. He was cursed for us. He was judged for us. He took the penalty for our sin. He became sin. He became curse. Curse. Because it's written, curse is everyone that hangs on, on a tree. It's a fascinating account. This serpent hanging on a pole. And what does it say in our study here? Chapter 21 of Numbers. Look in verse 9. It says in the latter part of verse 9. It, well, verse, verse 9 says, Moses made a bronze serpent, put it on a pole. So it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze servant, what happened? He lived. Just li looked at it, and he lived. Isaiah 45, verse 22 says what? Look unto me, and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there's none else. 
What did I do when I was 19 years old? I looked upon the Lord Jesus Christ. I looked with the eyes of faith. It wasn't just land. The word look, the Greek word for look in the New Testament, literally means to lust. It means to, to, to look and to fix your eyes upon them. Look upon me. Look, fix your eyes upon me. Not just glance. It's not a casual glance. It is a fixation. And that is, the, that is the eye of faith. When we look upon Christ, when I trusted Christ, I looked upon Jesus. So what is God saying here? If you just look at the serpent, if you look at the pole, you'll be healed. What a picture. What a marvelous picture of Christ. These serpents bite them. They're all dying. They come to Moses. Have God take away the serpents. The answer is no, I'm not going to take it away. I'll give you another way to be healed. How is that? A bronze you know, a, you know, a bronze serpent on a pole? And yet if they looked upon that when they were bitten. Now, if they didn't look upon that when they were bitten, they died. Just like today. Individuals are bitten by sin. They're going to die and go to hell. The wages of sin is death. Someone's going to pay the price. But if you look upon Christ, if you trust in Jesus, if you believe on him, you're healed. The Bible says God removes our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. He satisfies that great longing. He's the man from heaven that satisfies, that feeds us. As the Bible says, as Jesus said, my flesh is meat indeed and my, my blood is drink indeed. Yes. And he doesn't mean literal flesh and literal blood. He means he died on the cross. But when Jesus said that, remember what I was talking about. Those people were coming and following him because for the, they were for the wrong reasons. So Jesus made these statements like, what are you talking about? We've got to eat your flesh and drink your blood. This is crazy. They got very offended by that. Just like today, people don't understand this. They they're hear it, but they don't grasp it. They're on a road that's going to lead one day when their heart's going to stop and they're going to plunge into eternity and they're going to realize what they've done without Christ. But if you look upon the Lord and trust in Jesus, you will be transformed. He will satisfy that deep heart that you have. He will separate your sins from you as far as the east from the west. You will be saved. You will be born again. You will be healed. You will be totally healed from the, 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 you know, the ways of sin's death. You will be healed from the ultimate penalty of sin, which is separation from God for eternity. It's just amazing. I just, love, I just love this stuff. When I read this, I'm like, wow, this is so amazing. And I remember thinking, what does bronze mean? I looked it up. I'm studying. Look, Bronze means judgment? <laughs> and all of a sudden, you know, the spirit's at work. And the spirit's saying, hey, remember the serpent? <gasps> no wonder it was a serpent. It was this Satan, this sin, this, this bite of sin that has struck us, the whole human race, has been bitten, if you will, by sin. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Well, no wonder. It's so clear. And then look, you just have to look upon him, but not glance at him. He's got to fill our whole vision. He's got to be the focus of our heart. Jesus said, if your eye be single, your whole body is full of light. But if your eye is evil, your whole body is full of darkness. If you're looking at the world and sin, your whole, your whole body is just corrupted by sin and evil and wickedness. Look at our current culture today. Look at our world today. It's just wicked and perverted. That's why we look at Christ. I don't know, it's just a great, I just love this. Look in verse 10. Yeah, we may get, well, we'll probably just get this one verse, chapter in. Look in verse 10 now. We'll keep moving here pretty quickly. Now, the children of Israel moved on and camped in Oboth, and they journeyed from Oboth and camped at Abiram. I won't go through all this. They just go to different places. And in verse 20, from Bamoth, uh, uh, in the valley that is in the country of Moab to the top of Pisgah, which, which looks down on the wasteland. So Pisgah is the place, right, getting closer to this place where they'll look over and to see the Jordan, the, uh, the Jordan and into the promised land. That's where God's taken them. Then look also, if you will, down in verse 21. These are two kings that Israel's going to defeat. Then Israel sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites, and said... Remember, the Amorites were one of the people groups that God said, you're going to wipe them out. They're so corrupted. They're, they're so infected with sin and rebellion and demonic influence. they got to be wiped out. Let me pass through your land. They just asked permission to go through the land. We will not turn aside into the fields or vineyards. We will not drink water from the wells. We will go by the King's Highway. Again, the King's Highway was a major road that travelers went through just to grow, go through the land. It's like the major expressways. Look, I want to get on 85 and go through Alabama. 
I remember when I was a kid, they hadn't finished making 85, and we would go to Mississippi, and we'd go through all these back, I don't want to get into that. But the King's Highway was amazing. We just want to go in the King's Highway. We'll, we'll stay the three million of us. We just want to go through the land. We won't bother anybody. Verse 23, but Sihon would not allow Israel to pass through its territory. And here, here's a dumb thing they do. Sihon gathered all of his people together and went out against Israel in the wilderness. And he came to Jahaz and fought against Israel. Why, why, why do that? Why Again, what did God say about Israel? He that touches you touches the apple of my eye. God will not allow these people to defeat his people. He's going to come and rescue them. So, verse 24, Then Israel defeated him with the edge of the sword, took possession of his land from Arnon to the Jabesh, that was two, two brooks, as far as the people of Ammon, for the border of the people of Ammon was, was for, fortified. So Israel took all these cities, and Israel dwelt in all the cities of the Amorites, and Heshbon, and all these villages. Again, this is on the east side of the Jordan River, okay, towards the south. Let's keep reading. For Heshbon was the city of Sihon, king of the Amorites, who had fought against the former king of Moab, and had taken all of his land from his hand as far as the Arnon, that was a river. Therefore, those who speak in, the, in Proverbs, they say, and here's the story of this defeat, come to Heshbon, let it be built, let the city of Sihon be repaired. For, the, for fire went out from Heshbon, a flame from the city of Sihon. It consumed Ar of Moab, the lords of the heights of the, Ar, of the Arnon. Woe to you, Moab, you have perished, O people of Chemosh. Chemosh was a false god that they worshipped. He has given his sons as fugitive and his daughters captivity to Sihon, king of the Amorites. But we have shot at them. Heshbon is perished as far as Dibon. Then we laid waste as far as Naph, which re reaches to Medeba. Verse 31, thus Israel dwelt in the land of the Amorites. So they defeated them, and they dwelt, they took over their land. Then Moses sent to spy out Jazer, and they took the, its villages and drove out the Amorites who were there. So this was the, all the land of these people were taken over by Israel. Later on, when they want to go over Jordan, uh, th two and a half of the tribes want to stay over in this land, and we want to stay over here and, and, and ha inhabit this side. And so God allows that. And that's part of his plan. Look in verse 33, another dumb thing. Dumb things just keep piling up, don't they? And they turned and went uh, the way to Bashan. So Og, king of Bashan, went out against them, he and all of his people, to battle at Indre. Then the Lord said to Moses, Do not fear him, for I have delivered him into your hand with all of his people and his land. And you shall do to him as you did unto Sihon, king of the Amorites, who dwelt in Heshbon, so they defeated him, his sons, and all of his people until there was no survivor left him, and they took possession of his land. So they wiped out this guy. You know, Sihon and Og, where their whole lands taken over by Israel and wiped out. This was on the east side of the Jordan River. And this whole area, matter of fact, later on they'll say, this is great land for cattle. Some of the tribes come and say, look, we want to stay over here. We got a lot of cattle. Can we hang out over here instead of going over? They say, well... Send your warriors over with us, and if they fight and hang out until we're all ready to, to defeat all these people, then you guys can settle over there. But if you just want to hang out over here and take it easy and not fight, then no, the answer is no. So they decide to send over their warriors, and they went over there and fought on the other side, the, the west side, and then they, their, their family stayed on the, the, the east side and settled in this land. It was a good land. It was part of the, the place where God said to them to stay, so... Let's pray. Father, this evening as we close, I want to thank you for your word. And I, and I just praise you and thank you that in the, as we go through the scriptures, as we look at the Old Testament and all these passages, we are just able to understand that you've been speaking regarding your son throughout the Old Testament. From Genesis chapter 15, the first prophecy about you coming and crushing the head of the serpent, even though he will bruise your heel, he's going to wound you. Uh, he's the one that's going to be responsible for putting Christ on the cross. Yet by doing that, his head, the head of the serpent, Satan himself, his head was crushed. He's defeated. And we know that one day very soon you're going to come, Lord Jesus, and you're going to establish your kingdom on this earth because you are King of kings and Lord of lords. And I want to thank you that as individuals, we have tasted and seen the Lord is good. 
We don't want to ever say, we're sick of this manna. We're sick of this bread from heaven. We're sick of this. No, you always satisfy. We pray that the more that we taste and see the Lord is good, the more we pursue you and understand you and see you and look upon you and, and grow in our, in our grasping who you are, the, the, the more excited, the more hungrier, the more thirsty we would get for you. I'm reminded of Philippians where Paul mentioned, I'm pursuing the Lord. I follow hard after Jesus. As David said in, in Psalms, as the deer pants after water brooks, so my soul pants after you. And even though we've come to know you, I know when I was 19, I gave my life to Jesus, and you satisfied that deep longing of my heart. I tasted and I saw the Lord is good. He has forgiven my sins. I'm no longer afraid of dying. I'm no longer afraid of eternity. I'm no longer afraid of being in God's presence. I'm longing to be with him. And yet that began at that age of 19, a pursuit, a hungering. As we study the Bible, we grow and we read the word. We, we continually see this a marvelous revelation of Jesus throughout the Bible. And I thank you for that. And I just pray tonight even somehow there may be some insight given regarding Jesus. We understand that this individual, he became sin for us. Do we understand what that means when we think about this serpent on a pole, that which was cursed hanging on a pole, a bronze serpent on a bronze pole, a picture of it was judge, judgment falling upon this. And it's because he was judged, because he was hung on a tree, therefore that's how we're saved. We look upon the Lord. We believe in Christ. And even though we've been bitten by sin, and again and again, we have sinned. We have sinned over and over thousands of times. And yet you've forgiven us of all of our sins. Why? Because we believe on Jesus Christ. And we are healed and set free. And we thank you for that. So I pray this evening that we would worship you. We would tell others about you. We would point to you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Let me just give...